1992, there was a TV show called The Hat Squad. It was about these three adopted brothers who all became police officers because their parents were police officers who died on the job. And they're called the Hat Squad because they, uh, they, they wear hats. This is what entertainment was like in the year 1992. Either you watched the Hat Squad or you went outside and, uh, I don't know, played lawn darts or something. But if you were really lucky and had a home computer back then, you could also play a little game called Wolfenstein 3D. And Wolfenstein had everything. Graphics, sounds, gameplay, it even had a story. See, look. Oh, sorry. It looks like my copy of the manual has some printing defects or something. Uh, let me just turn to another page here. Uh, here we go. Episode 2. You escape from Castle Wolfenstein. Uh, more evidence. Operation Ein Eisenfaust uncovered. Something about a guy named Hit Dashler. Don't know who that is. I guess he's probably introduced in the first episode. Anyway, this is how stories were usually included in games back in the day. Especially in shooters, which were always a little bit slower on the uptake in that regard. There were occasionally attempts with FMV or good old fashioned person talking in your head storytelling, but. If you think the writing was scarce back then, boy, <laughs> wait till you see the acting. What's that you say? RCSD? Why, it stands for Remote Control Self-Destruct. <laughs> Eventually, pioneer games like Doom moved all that manual text from the manual to a screen in between levels. And then those were eventually replaced by pre-rendered and in-engine cutscenes, which led to set pieces and that helicopter crash sequence from COD 4 that they keep milking. And that just about catches us up to today. You know what they say, if it ain't broke, sell it to them again and again and again. But somewhere around here, just after the decline of the old wall of text and just before in-game cutscenes really started to gain traction, is Half-Life. Now, if you know anything about anything, you already know that Half-Life is a legendary game. Instead of reading the manual and walking around like, I don't know, I guess this guy's called Blowjob Blaskovitz or something. You walk up to a scientist in Half-Life and they're like, Gordon, we have complete confidence in you. That's me, I'm Gordon. And that's basic stuff by today's standards, but when reviewers saw this in 1998, it was like when people saw film for the first time and they were afraid the train was going to come through the screen and kill them. Half-Life 2 further innovated on this by actually letting you get hit by a train. But I think Half-Life 1 is the more refined choice for my money. It gets that because it's a very linear game, it doesn't really have to hold the player's hand that often. There's no here's your objective text in the UI, there's no waypoints or markers, there are scientists and security guards here and there who will get you up to speed, but they're placed just sparsely enough- sparsely? But they're placed just sparsely enough to not get in the way of the core gameplay. It rarely feels like you're just waiting around for them to stop talking, especially because uh, you can turn them into a stain at any moment with very few consequences. I I'm actually not sure how to... St like, I, I guess it's neat. Although it does make it a bit awkward in Half-Life 2 when Barney's like, It's me, Gordon. Barney from Black Mesa. Oh yeah, I remember you. I murdered 17 people who look exactly like you. I guess that sort of plays into Gordon being willing to do anything to survive. It's easy to forget, but before he was the face of a human rebellion, Dr. Freeman was just a guy with a PhD and a cushy 9-to-5 lab job. But lo and behold, on this particular day, schlopping the carrier into the analysis port meant that all the lab coats at Black Mesa would become the Lab Rats. Trapped in a labyrinth of their own design, where around every corner is a new test of wit, or will, or wow, those are some big, meaty claws. I guess in a way it's kind of appropriate that the event that leads to the enslavement of humanity was an accident. And not that accidents are without blame, they don't just fall out of the sky. But it's hard to point the finger at anyone in particular. I mean, Freeman was just doing his regular job. The scientists conducting the experiment didn't even know where these weird samples came from. And while the management and the other arms of Black Mesa were definitely fucking around, I'm not sure anyone could have predicted to find out this hard. Obviously it was a bad experiment, but does accidentally ushering forth a green apocalypse make them bad people? I don't know. That's for you, the gamer, to decide. Leave a comment below if you would murder your coworkers. <laughs> it's also a bit of the old Frankenstein debacle at its core. In pursuit of a great advancement of science, 
the doctor summons forth a monster and in doing so finds a monster in himself. Just replace the single Dr. Frankenstein with a much larger science team and replace the single monster with a diverse cast of goo spitters and green lightning goblins who are also kind of enslaved. And suddenly the ethics and morality become a lot harder to calculate. And the game never really forces you to think about this stuff either. At the end of the day, survival comes first. Instead of holding a carrot on a stick to motivate you forward, Half-Life shoves you from behind. That light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, that's a trip mine. Oh, you finally made it to the surface? Looks like it's raining outside. You want some supplies? Here's some Black Ops ninjas in full body suits doing cartwheels. By the way, can you tell this game was made in 1998? Now, if the whole game was just you getting whacked in the head repeatedly like this, it would get draining pretty quick. And that's why they're paced out with little puzzles for you to sort of relax with. Take a minute, hit some buttons, slide some boxes around. These days when shooters want to give you a break, usually they just give you a cutscene, which makes you almost want to put your controller down if it's long enough. It's kind of a weird balance. I think Half-Life hits it perfectly though. Something about the quiet of the vent sections, that little stillness between waves of enemies. It can be a tense pause when you're low on health or ammo, or maybe a nice relief when you've got everything under control. Or at least, when you think you've got everything under control. One of the most common themes in sci-fi is exploring what lies beyond the edge of our understanding. And while Half-Life is far from the first to answer that question with aliens, I think the way that it does it brings a really unique perspective. Black Mesa didn't set out to explore the deep reaches of space. They weren't even looking for aliens in the first place. They do physics. They study lasers. Yeah, they make rockets and a bit of weaponry here and there, but they aren't SETI. They accidentally crossed into Zen like a tripwire. Likewise, Gordon showed up to work just to put the thing in the thing and not only discover that there's a crazy dimension full of aliens, but also that his employer has been taking samples and researching it right under everyone's noses. All this crazy shit seems so far away and difficult to reach, but once you reach it, it feels like it's always been lurking close by, just waiting to be discovered. And no matter how far you crawl, no matter how many aliens or soldiers you kill, you're still a rat trying to find the cheese. There's this entire part of reality that even if you see, even if you touch, you can never fully grasp. And that's the case from the very beginning all the way to the end. Is this footage going into the Half-Life video? Yes, but only this clip of me saying that right now. 